today. We want to invite you to into our services today. Uh, today I have a special message for you. A message that is designed to give us a sense of calm in the midst of turmoil. Um, Jesus has a great invitation for all who will come to him. It is an invitation to enter into his rest. And then as we enter into that rest, we now begin to um, take up the very yoke of Jesus, begin to be conformed into his image and likeness. And as we mature in Christ, we're able to find a lasting rest, a rest uh, that comes from a spiritual fulfillment that we all have as we seek to do the will of God. So tune in with us today as we talk about the importance of finding the rest that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Everybody ought to hold to his hand. Hold on to my God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold to his hand. To a God's unchanging hand. You ought to feel, feel with your hopes on things he got. Praise the Lord, saints, and all those who have joined us today to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth here at the Lion Street Church of Christ. We are so thankful that you have joined us today as we attempt to worship God in the best way that we know how and to lift his name, for he is worthy to be praised. The Bible says that this is the day the Lord hath made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. So we are so thankful that you and your family and all those who are with you have decided to join us today virtually as we worship the Lord. Our hope and our prayer is that one day we'll be able to come back here into the assembly to worship together. But until that time, we're going to lift up the, 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 the name of the Lord in the best way that we know how. As we begin our service, we always do, we always start off with a call to worship, which is a scripture of the Bible that we read, and a prayer just to get our hearts and our minds in the correct mood and mindset in order to worship the Lord. We ask that if there's anything that is ailing you, anything that is on your mind, any type of issue that you may have brought into um, uh, the service with you, that you try to let that go. Try to suppress that right now as we enter into the worship service that your heart and your mind can be truly and wholly focused on God. Um, as we enter into our um, worship service, we ask that wherever you're at, if you're able to stand, that you please do, as we read our call to worship scripture, which is Psalms 100, verses 1 through 5. 
Psalms 100, verses 1 through 5. And I ask that you would please repeat after me. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Come into his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us. It is he who hath made us. And not we ourselves. And not we ourselves. We are his people. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. And bless his name. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. And his truth endureth to all generations. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for all that you are and all that you have done for us, Father God. We bless thy holy and divine name, Father God, for waking us up this morning and starting us on our way. We pray, Father God, that as we enter into this worship service, that we will be able to worship you as you command us in spirit and in truth. For we know that you are looking for those to worship you in such a manner. Father God, we thank you, Father God, for allowing us to experience all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. Not just our physical blessings, Father God, but also our spiritual blessings. Father God, we thank you so much for allowing us into your family, for washing us clean as, and, and our robes white in the blood of the Lamb. We thank you so much for forgiveness and mercy. We thank you so much for the name of your son, Jesus, that gives us power to overcome all of our problems. We thank you so much for knowing that you always have our hand and always have our back, no matter what we may go through. And Father God, allow this truth to be what allows us to stand in the face of adversity, to allow us to stand in the face of trials and tribulations, to allow us to stand in the face of sickness and death, Father God. Allow us to know that thou art with us even until the ends of the earth. And Father God, we thank you. We bless your holy and divine name, and we pray that this worship service may be pleasing and acceptable to your holy and divine eyesight. In the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, we do pray. Amen. We've now come to the point of our service where we commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and a portion of our service that we call communion of the Lord's Supper. It is now we prepare our hearts and minds. On a hillside so lonely, there oh, Jesus one day. Because when we look at the Lord's Supper, we have to understand that not only is it celebratory, but it's also a great deal of solemnity associated with this feast. In other words, it's a solemn occasion as well. Because when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are remembering the agony, the suffering, uh, and the passion of Jesus, which had its culmination on the uh, the cross at Calvary, where Jesus died for us, a substitutionary death. He died that we might live. So now as we sit at table and we begin to engage in this feast, our minds go back to that uh, moment where through his stripes we were healed. So as members of the body of Christ today, as we partake of these emblems, it is a memorial, a very solemn occasion when we look at uh, what Jesus accomplished for us. And now we who are in the body of Christ, we begin to understand more fully how we show appreciation to him by understanding that he bore his cross, 
that we may now bear our cross on a daily basis as we now live for him who died for us. So let us give thanks as we partake of the bread. Our Father and our God in heaven, our hearts are rejoicing as we solemnly reflect on the vicarious death of Jesus, how he died uh, for us, that we may live for him. Bless us as we partake of this bread, dear God, that we may understand that as members of the body of Christ, uh, we have been delivered uh, into the divine kingdom. And we pray that you give us the grace to move and operate as citizens of that kingdom. And as we take it, a particular bread, we are pledging that we are indeed the unleavened body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I take in my hand the fruit of the vine, it, it further um, gives expression to the fact that Jesus, in that suffering, he shed his blood. And the shedding of that blood was very symbolic because it was the shedding of blood that ratifies the covenant. And we are now in covenant relationship with the Heavenly Father by virtue of what Jesus accomplished when he shed his blood. And now that covenant has been ratified. And we enjoy the covenant benefits of the covenant promises. And we now pledge, as we partake of this, that we're ready to live up to our covenant responsibility. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you uh, that we're able to uh, engage in this feast. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, dear God, we're pledging that we are uh, committed to filling up that which is lacking in the suffering of Christ. In other words, we will take up our cross and follow you uh, all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another fellowship component of our worship is the giving, or what we call the offering. And that's what we uh, do two things. We demonstrate our faith righteousness by giving back to God a, a portion of what he has given to us, uh, demonstrating our faith and dependence on him to supply all of our needs. And then also, uh, as we give um, out of the right of possession. In other words, as we have been blessed to give, and when we, when we see opportunities to meet needs that test the sincerity of our love. So I'm glad at this congregation, we are always putting for this congregation opportunities to give um, out of your right of possession. We have many things that we're doing at this congregation that uh, would need sometimes for us to go beyond our natural or regular giving. And so if you feel so inclined to give an offering today, if God has blessed you in some kind of unexpected way, or whatever the situation may be, uh, if he has placed on your heart not only to give um, to support the ministry, we have other opportunities for you to give uh, to support certain saints who may have a certain need or whatever the case may be. I want to uh, direct your attention to, on our website, uh, if you would like to give online, you can go to uh, online giving, and uh, you can make sure you are giving your gifts there. Again, I always like to say to our guest viewers that this is not a time of solicitation on our part, uh, but we are just making available the opportunity for anyone who wants to express their love for God monetarily, you can do that here at the Lion Street uh, Church of Christ. Let us pray. Dear God, I ask your blessings on all of those who uh, are hearing this message and are, you've placed on their heart a desire uh, to promote the upbuilding of your kingdom here at the Lion Street Church. We pray to God that you not only bless them and supply all of their needs, but give them the ability to gain wealth, that they may be able to uh, be active and proactive in performing every good work. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Once again, I want to say welcome to all of you who tuned in today. Welcome to the Lion Street Church of Christ. And uh, to all of you who are joining in, we appreciate so very, very much you taking your time, taking time out to be with us on today. You know, as we go into this message, uh, let me just say, first of all, that as we enter into a new week, uh, we can all say with certainty, and that is, we are tired. <laughs> 
We're tired on so many levels. As we deal with the fact that we are emotionally drained, as we deal with the pandemic and all of the problems associated with that, uh, the, uh, the stress and distress that people are in because of that pandemic, be it economically, be it socially, be it even politically. Politically, we are just drained and stretched and, and, and mentally we're exhausted. Socially, we've been polarized and physically, we've been stretched to the limit. So it goes without saying, there seems to be no end in sight, oftentimes. But sometimes it's good to just be able to have a sigh of relief. Just be able to uh, quiet yourself and then have some rest. And it's to that end, I'd like to share this message with you on today. You see, we are all called uh, into service. But we have to understand that all of us, from time to time, are in need of rest. So I want to... Uh, extend to you uh, the invitation that Jesus extends to all of us. All humanity has been called into his rest. He understands that the pressure, the circumstances of life can, can be burdensome on us, and they can drain us, and they can push us to the limit. And so Jesus comes with a great, the great invitation to find rest in him. And I want to say about this rest that Jesus offers everyone that includes you and all of you who are viewing with us today. Everyone is welcomed into his rest. Everyone is, uh, can be a recipient of this great invitation for rest in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew, the 11th chapter. And today we're going to be looking at verses uh, 28 through 30. Again, at Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 28 uh, through uh, 30. Again, this great invitation is an invitation of rest. And if we find rest in Jesus, uh, we will be able to say we are surely at peace with God and with ourselves. And again, this, this passage uh, that we find here, it, it's in the context of uh, a great announcement that Jesus offers as the great king of the world. Now, I want to say this. Um, when we look at when we look at uh, Matthew, the entire book, the gospel according to Matthew, we're able to see some things that uh, are very glaring, and they help us to get a, a, a firm foundational understanding of Jesus the person, uh, Jesus the man, and his ministry and mission. You see, it is Jesus, uh, the book of Matthew pronounces Jesus as the great king. And so therefore, he is the one who has established his kingdom. And therefore, if he is the king, then we are citizens of that kingdom. So we have to understand the, the, the truth and the essence of kingdom living. So therefore, Jesus, in the book of Matthew, we find him uh, declaring himself to be the great king. Now notice, notice uh, to announce, he wants to announce himself as the king who is able to extend the great invitation to all of those who will accept it. It is your and my uh, response to that invitation that solidifies and secures our relationship with him uh, uh, for eternal life. Now, I want to say but this invitation, it offers a comprehensive rest for mind, body, and soul. But we must have a willing heart to accept uh, the invitation of Jesus in order to enter into that rest uh, that he and only he can provide. Do we get that? Now, the objective of this lesson is very simple. It is that we will examine just what it takes to produce a heart that is willing to submit to God in order to enter into his rest. You see, it is that we might accept the invitation uh, and then enter therein. If I could choose for a theme, I would simply say that this message is all about how to find rest in a restless world. How to find rest in a restless world. In other words, we want to look at the steps toward uh, embracing the rest that Jesus offers. Now, to contextualize this message, I think it makes sense for us to 
kind of peruse for just a moment uh, the book of Matthew. For the book of Matthew presents Jesus as the great king. Notice uh, in Luke uh, chapter uh, 4 and verse 18. Well, before I go to Luke, let me say that even in the book of Matthew, in, 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 in Matthew chapter uh, 1 through 4, uh, verse 11, the Bible introduces the king by giving the king's background. It talks about the birth of Jesus. It talks about the genealogy of Jesus. It talks about uh, those things, and then it begins to talk about uh, Jesus as a grown man uh, being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So all of those things were the background of the great king. But then in chapter 4, in verse number uh, 12 through chapter 13, and verse 58, we see the king's ministry. After he has come and emerged from the wilderness, having been tempted by Satan and had been victorious in that struggle with Satan, now he begins to move uh, into his purpose. He moves into his ministry. And therefore, uh, notice what happens in chapter 14 through chapter 20. We see the king's journey. As he begins to move and he begins to make a journey that will find its final resting or destination in Calvary, on the cross of Calvary. And then in, in chapter uh, 21 uh, through chapter 27, we see the king's tragedy, uh, the, the betrayal of Jesus, the passion of Jesus, and the very crucifixion of Jesus, and the, the burial of Jesus, and the weeping and the sorrow associated with this tragic episode in human history. And finally, and finally, uh, in chapter 28, we see the king's triumph, when he rises victorious from the grave, and he assembles his disciples, he says, all authority, all authority in heaven and earth have been given unto me, and then he gives the great commission. So as we begin to chronicle uh, the book of Matthew, we see that Jesus is indeed the great king who has established his great kingdom, and he has given an invitation for us to get you into that kingdom and thus find rest. So therefore, as we look at the king's ministry, uh, we are able to, uh, to understand just what Jesus is accomplishing. Notice, uh, again, in chapter 4 through th uh, 13, as we look at the king's ministry, it is there, within that couched context, that Jesus makes a statement when he says, come unto me. Come unto me, all you who are weary and, and, and heavy laden. It is an invitation for people to come out of the cold. It is an invitation to those who have been uh, uh, like scattered sheep, wandering, looking for peace, looking for solace, looking for uh, tranquility. He invites them, and therefore he invites you and I into that rest. And we're going to talk about that today. And hopefully, as we go through this, we will emerge from this uh, message ready uh, to not only embrace uh, the primary invitation, but then also to recognize there are some secondary uh, uh, invitations extended to us in this text. Now, I want to say uh, that in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and following, uh, it, it shows uh, that Jesus has the authority uh, to offer us this rest. It's in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus says, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. We know the, the text. He says, preach the gospel of the poor, and that gospel being proclaimed is going to result in those who are uh, uh, broken, uh, being uh, bound up. Those who are have been spoiled will now be healed. Those who are downtrodden uh, and lame uh, and who have been just beat down by life's circumstances can find peace and can find rest in him. And so it's, it's it becomes incumbent on us to understand uh, that Jesus, based on his heavenly authority, okay, is able to offer this rest. In Matthew chapter 16, in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus was on the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he had a conversation with his disciples, and he asked them, he says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? 
And then many begin to try to take a stab at answering that question. Some say this, and some say that. Some say you were Jeremiah, and some say you were one of the prophets, you Isaiah, Elijah, on and on and on. But he looked at him eyeball to eyeball. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And it was with that, Peter said, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the reason why I bring that up is because, you know, Jesus said, you know, that is not something that you were able to, to get by you in uh, query. But uh, my heavenly Father has revealed that to you. And he said to you, I say to you, Peter, that upon this rock, upon this foundation of truth, that I am the Christ, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he said, and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom associated with the church uh, and the kingdom. And so now we have to understand that now that we are in the kingdom, we look back at that passage and say that Jesus is all able to offer that uh, rest based on the authority that he is indeed the Christ. But not only is it a is it a heavenly authority? It's also an anticipated authority. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, once again, when he said all authority, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. He said, based on that, I am now sending you to proclaim the very message that is going to result in life for those who are dead in sin. And then finally, it is a transferred authority because in his priestly prayer of John chapter 17, he says, I am praying um, that uh, he first he said, sanctify them, his disciples, um, through that truth. He says, that word is truth. And it helps us to understand that uh, when we are sanctified, he said that they may all be one. So when you are sanctified by the truth, you will be one. He said, that the, he said I don't pray only for them but also to all who will believe in me through their name. In other words, now we as believers have been given transferred authority. Just as Jesus had the authority to call people to his rest, now he has given us, he's transferred that authority to you and I, that we can preach the good news of Jesus Christ and also beckon others to come into the rest of Christ. All right, having said all of that, now let us get into uh, this message for today. Sorry about that. Notice, number one, it is an invitation to the rest of salvation. The rest of salvation. Let's go back into the text. Again, it's Matthew chapter uh, 11 and verse number 28. He says, he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This invitation represents the very purpose for the ministry of Jesus. This invitation uh, exposes the fact that he came here for a purpose, to offer rest to those who are lost, to offer rest to those who are hurting, those who have been disenfranchised, for those who have been uh, caught up in the, uh, the human drama and have been uh, adversely impacted, and now they, they are heavy laden, they are weary, and they are uh, bruised, and they are tired, they're like sheep without a shepherd. And therefore, Jesus, he is able to come and say, I want to give you a rest that only I can give. He says, come unto me. Which helps us to understand that uh, he is the origin of this rest. He is the origin of this rest. See, Jesus, uh, the king, presents a universal, a universal availability of his rest. In other words, uh, everyone, everyone who has been uh, caught up in the, the vicissitudes of life and who have been uh, beat down by the circumstances of life, uh, who have now been, become wearied and are ready to give in, to give up and even get out. They can find peace. They can find rest in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the one who is able to offer this rest uh, because rest originates in him. See, many seek truth uh, but never find it. Many seek rest 
but never find it. Because we're looking for truth. We're looking for rest in all the wrong places. He says, if you want rest, you know, don't go to all of these man-made uh, facades of easy living. All you need to do is come to me. Because I'm the one who's able to offer uh, what you need, what you're looking for. Okay? We must look to Jesus. And he will give you rest. Then he says, as, as he says, come unto me. He says, but I'll give you rest. This is a rest that he offers. This is not a rest that you earn. It is a rest that only he can give. This is the rest of salvation. When you realize your need for Jesus, when you realize uh, that the only place you can find this kind of solace, rest, and peace is in him, that will cause you to come. The ultimate qualification for accepting this rest is simply this. Uh, understanding your need for rest. Understanding your unredeemed condition. Notice what he says. He says, uh, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Sometimes people can't come to Jesus because they don't recognize or appreciate the fact that they need Jesus. Sometimes people come into the church uh, because they want to be involved in some kind of good charitable activity. They want to be associated with a certain group of people. But you see, that is not rest. That may be church affiliation. But Jesus said, all you need to do to come to me is to recognize your need for me. All of you who are uh, uh, weary, all of you who are just tired, now, we could talk about reasons why this may be stated. Perhaps those who have been burdened by the law. Um, again, we're talking about Jesus coming on the scene where Judaism and all of its requirements and all of its observances and all of its pressures uh, had really, and, and that religion had really become a burden on people. Just like uh, uh, an ox, which is a beast of prey. A, a beast of burden, I should say. Um, and, and, and all day long, that ox uh, has to work. And a yoke is put on that ox. And I'm sure that uh, he is using this imagery to help people understand that if you have been burdened, if you are weary and beat down and pressured, I'm talking to the poor. I'm talking to the lost. I'm talking about the ones who have been ruined. Those who recognize uh, that the burdens of life can be the sin in this world. Yeah, you know, when a person sins and lives a life of sin, uh, it becomes a burden. And the pressures of life begin to burden you and it wear you down. And Jesus is saying, I am able to give you everything you need in order uh, to have vigor, to have life once again. So the ultimate qualifications to come and receive this rest is to be weary and to recognize that, admit that, that you are a sinner. Man has been burdened death. Because sin puts a burden on your conscience. Yes, it does. Sin can wear you out. And because when you understand the magnitude of your sin, the guilt of that sin begins to be a weight on you. Many people who become uh, immersed in sinful behavior and allow guilt to uh, burden them, they begin to engage in dysfunctional characteristics. They begin to engage in denial. They begin to blame others for their predicament. They begin to isolate. They begin to uh, uh, have guilt trips on themselves. And, and before you know it, they are just a shadow and a shell of a person. Sin can suck the very life out of you. So when Jesus extends this invitation, he says, I am going to rejuvenate you and revitalize you with my spirit. Notice what the Bible says in John uh, chapter 6. He said, I am the bread of life, verse number 35. I am the bread of life. He that cometh uh, to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But you can't receive the bread of life. You can't receive the spiritual nourishment until you first admit your need for that nourishment. Okay, those who are heavy laden, he says, uh, and, and those who are weary and heavy laden. You see, rest from uh, sin because you can become uh, alarmed 
again, when you understand from a conscious level uh, uh, the, the gravity and the magnitude of your sin, it can be heavy laden and the, 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 the alarms of life, the, the terrors of the law, and from the fear of eternal death. When you understand uh, that your life is separated from God and, and therefore you are an object of his wrath, your life begins to be a life of terror, a life of uh, unease, if you will. You see, the unwavering promise of the invitation is simply this. Once you admit your need for him, he says, um, I will give you rest. I can't give you what you don't want. I can't give you what you think you don't need. But once you come to me, in other words, once you recognize and realize and confess your need for me, I am there to give you what you need. A relationship with Christ is rest. Notice the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3 that all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you're in Christ Jesus, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You see what I'm saying? That, my friends, is real rest. It's based on a relationship with him. Okay? And so therefore, number one, take this, write this down. If I want to receive the rest of salvation, the rest of eternal life, I need to do three things. Number one, acknowledge your need for the rest that he offers. We call that confession, right? Uh, acknowledge that. Uh, number two, acknowledge Jesus as the sole provider of that rest. You can read all the self-help books you want to. You can explore different religious you know, organizations if you want to. You can, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. You can drink, you can drug, and you can all that kind of stuff. But that's not going to give you satisfaction. It's not going to give you peace. It will not give you rest. Only Jesus can give you the rest that you need. Okay? And I pray that that is the rest that you seek. Not only that, but number three, after you have acknowledged your need for the rest, and after you have acknowledged Jesus as the sole provider of that rest, you must then uh, adhere to the conditions for that rest. In other words, you have to understand and apply the gospel requirements resulting in deliverance from your sins. Obeying the gospel is how you receive the rest of salvation. Secondly, and then I scurry through this, hurry through this, it's an invitation uh, to the rest of sanctification. Number one was salvation. Now we enter into the rest of sanctification. Let's look again at verse number 29 where it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He says, For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest. Underline the word find. You shall find. He said, The first thing he said, I will give you rest. That is the rest of salvation. It is something that you can't merit on your own. It is something that God freely bestowed on us based on our accepting Jesus as the sole provider of that rest. But in this particular passage, he says, now I want you to take my yoke upon you. I want you to be uh, linked with me. Remember I talked about the oxen being a, 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 a beast of burden. When they would plow, they would take an ox. And they would take a, a young ox and an old ox. So they would put a yoke on them. And that keeps them in line so we can exploit the strength of the young, but the discipline uh, and the regiment of, of maturity of the old. Jesus said, I want you to be linked with me. I want you to take my yoke upon you. Subordinate yourself to me. Submit to me and be in harmony with me. Okay? He says, now, understand it's not burdensome. Why? Because when you learn of me, you'll find that I am meek and lowly in heart. And when you link with me, you shall find rest for yourself. You see, the rest, uh, this rest, results from a quest for a deeper communion with Christ. It's one thing to come in and we have salvation. Now it's on you to have a desire for a deeper communion with him. Many seek salvation, but fewer seek spiritual maturity as it relates to taking up your cross uh, and embracing kingdom purposes. Yeah, we can talk about, I'm saved, I'm a member of the body of Christ, praise the Lord. 
But are you striving to be spiritually mature? Yeah, I'm spiritually mature. I, I know this book and I know this chapter and I know this verse. But how has that resulted in you now being linked up with Christ in terms of uh, embracing the very mission of Christ, living by the very purposes of Christ, engaging in activity that Jesus would engage in himself. You know, we see one of those little braces that had a little letter saying, what would Jesus do, right? But now that we are in Christ and we have explored what Jesus would do, the challenge is, what would Jesus have you to do? In every circumstance, in every personal situation, what would Jesus now have me to do? That's called spiritual maturation. And once we do that, we begin to move in a direction uh, that Jesus wants us to go in. We would be find ourselves taking uh, my yoke, being linked with Christ. The yoke of the kingdom versus the yoke of the law. The yoke of the kingdom versus the yoke of this world system. The yoke of the kingdom uh, simply means not only do I profess uh, faith in Christ, but then I begin to live a spirit-led life. Did you get that? Living a spirit-led life gives power to your uh, profession or your confession of Christ. It's a very practical thing. Notice, um, he says, take my yoke upon you. He says, and learn of me. Now, another word that I want to give you for that, that's simply the word discipleship. Discipleship. In other words, begin to follow Jesus. Begin to learn of him. Begin to uh, now begin to pattern your life after the life of Christ. See, this yoke of bondage. In the Old Testament, they talk about the yoke of bondage. The bondage of slavery. Okay? Before they received liberation from Egyptian bondage, they were under the yoke of bondage. Right? They dealt with, uh, Jesus dealt with the bondage or the yoke or the afflictions of the cross. Now, many of us uh, who are not in Jesus, we are dealing with the punishment, the eventual uh, uh, punishment from our sins. Sometimes we are caught up in the, even in the church, we can be caught up in the yoke of legalism. We can get caught up in, in many different yokes. But the bottom line is Jesus is saying, uh, you, I want you to be yoked with me. And this yoke, see, religion is a yoke, okay? Uh, but the religion of the Redeemer is a certain kind of yoke. He says, because I am meek and lowly <laughs> in heart. See, sometimes, you know, when you get, some folk get married, they are equally yoked. Some people have friends and acquaintances that are, you are unequally yoked. But when you are yoked with Jesus, you will find that it's not burdensome because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. In other words, uh, Jesus came to give you rest. Jesus came and said, I came to seek and save that which is lost, right? But in John chapter 15, he said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He said, now watch it. When you abide in me, when you are yoked to me, when you are under my yoke, you will bear much fruit. John chapter 10, verse number 10. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So this invitation, now notice first of all, invitation for salvation. But now I want you to begin to begin to live in such a way that you now experience uh, eternal life. Because eternal life is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship, begin when you're linked with him and yoked with him, is going to manifest itself in you moving in a righteous direction a righteous path, developing the character of Christ, making decisions based on your relationship with Christ. And then you begin to live a purposeful, a fruitful, and a fulfilling life. Jesus calls that the abundant life. The abundant life can be experienced right now. It's not about when you die and go to heaven. Well, pray to God for that. But even as you matriculate through this world, you're able to have uh, joy, 
You are able to have satisfaction. You are able to receive rest because you are yoked with the Lord. Finally, uh, for such who seek this rest, you find it because Christ tells them to come to him, to believe in him, to trust in him, uh, and in him only for salvation. But in doing this, you will be given rest. But when you begin to learn of him and you begin to uh, understand the instructional conditions for finding rest, and they're simply this. You must take his yoke. Everything, uh, everyone has a yoke. Everyone has a yoke. Now, your yoke, your yoke is your light. Let me just say that, okay? When you allow your yoke uh, or your life, you cast that light down and I take on his. It will now uh, bring joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment uh, and rest to your life, even on the time side of life. You must submit to discipleship to Christ. In other words, you must now submit to spiritual and Christian maturity and an evidence of spiritual maturity is your ability to give birth. In the natural realm, when a man and a woman, when they mature, they now enter in a season of their life where they're able to reproduce. In the spiritual realm, what are you reproducing? In other words, uh, are you uh, experiencing the fruit of the Spirit? Is your life uh, manufacturing uh, joy, love, peace, uh, gentleness, patience, all of those attributes. Is your life resulting in the impact thing of others' lives? Who are you bringing to the Lord? All of those things have to do with how fruitful and how you have submitted to the rest of Christ. Finally, and the lesson will be yours. Christian service is not burdensome. He said, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you should find rest for yourself, right? Um, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, um, it's a joy. It ought to be a joy to serve Christ. It's not burdensome. It's a joy. Consider the joy not only to serve, um, that ought to be our heart's desire. So with your mind, body, and soul, you ought to want to give yourself to him. Take that yoke upon you. If you want rest, if you want rest, you must take up your yoke uh, and be united with him. For salvation is obeying the gospel. Hearing that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, repenting of your sins, confessing him as Lord, and being willing to be buried in the water of the grave of baptism for the remission of your sins, that takes all the guilt, the stain away. And now you enjoy the rest of that relationship. But then the rest of sanctification is when you begin to take your yoke upon yourself and learn of him that you can be like him. And therefore, now you spiritually, you're spiritually mature. I pray that as you go through this exercise today, or this lesson, that God will give you the desire to enter into the rest of salvation and also the rest of sanctification, resulting in uh, a rest that happens on this time side of life, but transcends the veil into eternal life. God bless you. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we, we come to you right now expressing our, our gratitude. You have given the great invitation, an invitation to find rest, even in a restless world. We pray to God that we will take upon ourselves that yoke uh, to be good stewards of the grace you've given, that we may be able to extend this great invitation to others. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let me just say this before we go off. If there's anything I said today that has caused you to think along your way, I praise God for that. Perhaps you want to partner with this ministry. You want to sow seeds to this ministry. Uh, we again invite you to go to our website, lionstreetcfc.org, and push the donation button, and you can donate to our efforts. Not only that, there is a phone number that will appear on your screen. If you have any need for services, if you're in need of prayer, if you have questions that relates to salvation, if you just want to engage in a good Bible study, we at the Lion Street Church of Christ are making ourselves available to you. So all you need to do is call that number and we can make sure that when you get consultation from a minister, you can get Bible study, you can get prayer, or whatever you need, we will do our best uh, to meet that need. So God bless you 
and have a great day. Mm -hmm.